Good afternoon. I am Dr. Vinod Malik, Co-Chairman, Department of Laparoscopic and General Surgery at Sir Gangaram Hospital. I welcome you on behalf of ASI to this webinar on intercostal drainage. Chest tube insertion is life-saving basic surgical procedure. Though a simple procedure, there is a need to standardize it so that patient gets an optimum outcome and complications are kept down to minimum. When to do it, how to do it, how to maintain it, when to remove it safely are important aspects of chest tube drainage. To talk to us about all this is none other than Professor Arvind Kumar, Director of the Institute of Chest and Robotic Surgery at Sir Gangaram Hospital. He is former Professor of Surgery at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Last but not least, he is the President of Association of Surgeons of India. And the topic of patient safety is very close to his heart. His greatest contribution outside his specialty of chest surgery is adoption and popularization of WHO safety checklist. He is country's foremost chest surgeon with a vast range of open laparoscopic and robotic surgeries. His agreeing to talk on this subject shows how much importance he accords to this procedure. Uh, over to Professor Kumar. But before we uh, hand over the mic to Professor Kumar, I have to say that uh, we will have a question answer session at the end of this program and Professor Kumar will be very happy to take your questions, comments and clarifications that you may have. And uh, we have this number which I would like to uh, like you to note down. It's a WhatsApp number so you can uh, put in your queries on this number if you have one and this will be taken up at the end of the program. The number is 958-1599918. I repeat, 958-1599918. And this program comes to you through the generous contribution by Healthier. Over to Professor Kumar for uh, his <coughs> covering up the topic, the topic of his uh, great experience of more than 30 years of practicing chest surgery. Professor Kumar. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Malik. First of all, my humble and sincere thanks to you for agreeing to be a moderator of this seminar. Uh, I know how busy you are and still you agreed to take time out of your OPD time and be with us for the next one and a half to two hours. That's very kind of you and my humble and sincere thanks to you. On behalf of Association of Surgeons of India, it's, uh, it's my very pleasant duty to welcome all the participants from across the country. I extend a welcome to all our members, non-members, faculty members, residents, and a very, very warm and very, very special welcome to physicians, pulmonologists, and pediatricians who have also join this program. So on behalf of ASI, a very warm and special welcome to all of them. My thanks also to HealthDM for starting this initiative. This initiative was started just three months, two months back. This is the third program and this program has been possible because of two persons and I must mention the name. One is our ASI's website secretary, Dr. Shivaram, who's watching us from city of Bangalore. Dr. Shivaram, this program has seen the day of light only because of your efforts. And equally importantly, it's been possible because of the generous support from Healthium Company. Now, as you all know, Healthium earlier used to be Suture India Limited, but by Suture of India Limited merging with two more companies, we have this new company called Healthium. And I would like to make a special mention of the young, dynamic and energetic new CEO of this company, Mr. Shirish Bafna, whom I met, Anish Ma, I, I, my apologies, Mr. Anish Bafna, whom I met at Bangalore uh, just about 15 days back. And I was really very happy at the vision that he has for the com country for this company access to precision medtech for every patient 
globally is the vision of this company and when he mentioned that he is working towards making ldm the largest indian medtech company i think it was a really a matter of joy on behalf of asi my sincere thanks to mr bafna and to over 200 colleagues from ldm across the country who have arranged the the programs to be telecast at all the centers with that introduction now why did we choose this topic say chest tube insertion is a very basic kind of topic but friends working in the field of chest surgery for last over 30 years i have come across every possible complication that one can have in the chest while people were inserting chest tube it's a very simple procedure very basic procedure something which is just like tracheostomy it's not a chest specific procedure it should be known to every doctor so therefore we thought when we are starting this new webinar series for people from across the country we should start from a topic which is simple and which will help a large number of people but before i move on let me have the pleasure of extending you greetings to across the country from all india institute which was my previous institution and from sir gangaram hospital which is my present institution of working the various topics which i wish to cover in the next 45 minutes quickly is indications for chest tube insertion how to insert it safely the various drainage systems available how to maintain this tube what are the indications when to remove the tube how to remove it safely sometimes some problems occur post chest tube removal how to tackle those problems and some special situations like loculated effusion and about 45 minutes later i would end with last two slides which will be the take home messages as far as this these topics are concerned so coming first to indications it's a uh, indicated when you have air or fluid or a combination of the two in the chest cavity so pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax is when you have air in the pleural cavity or when there is fluid like pleural effusion empyema hemothorax chylothorax or a combination of the two that is pyo pneumothorax hydro pneumothorax hemo pneumothorax which could be traumatic or secondary to uh, uh, surgery etc and some special situations like following a cardiac surgery chest surgery mediastinal surgery any pleural surgery or esophageal surgery in a post pneumonectomy situation and in cases of bronchopleural fistula or when we have treatment with sclerosing agents or pleurodiesis is being done so these are various indications when chest tube needs to be put now when you decide to put a chest tube it's important that a consent is taken from the patient after all it's an invasion on the patient's body and sometimes i have seen consent not being taken so in today's era it's absolutely vital that you take consent one next it's extremely important to explain the procedure to the patient time and again i have seen uh, that what is going to be done is not explained to the patient we are just they are just told oh some tube will be put and patient has lot of apprehension they face more than what they expected and at the end you have an unhappy patient so it's important that you explain to them what exactly you are going to do trust me it goes a long way in getting you cooperation from the patient during the procedure and at the end it leaves a satisfied patient rather than an unhappy complaining patient it's important to have a quiet patient and therefore it is advisable that some kind of a mild sedative may be given especially if the patient is extremely apprehensive it's vital and i would repeat it's vital to have an intravenous line or at least an intravenous access available because anything may happen while the tube is being put and if there is a mishap there is a problem there will be no time to get an iv access if the patient has rehydration or hypovolemia it's better to correct that before you start putting otherwise you'll have more problems at hand 
I generally have oxygen on flow on this patient, but it's important to have a pulse oximeter in place and if possible, another person available who can be actually looking at the pulse oximeter. And often asked question is, who should put this tube? Well, to my mind, chest tube insertion is a basic procedure. Every doctor should be able to put a chest tube, just like starting an IV line or doing a tracheostomy. But that person must have some experience and should be aware of the step. If not, he should be assisted by somebody who has an experience. Another thing is that while you are doing it, even if you are experienced, it's always better to have another pair of hands available at the site. It could be your resident, it could be your another doctor, it could be a nurse, but another pair of hands available so that in case there is an issue, you have somebody to help you. It's important to have a checklist available. So chest tube, a spare chest tube, the chest tube bottle, ICD set having instrument, drape, sutures, analgesics, there should be a checklist and you should have checked all these things before you actually put an incision. Oftentimes, we give an incision, then we suddenly ask for the chest tube, by chance chest tube slips from your hand, it falls on the floor and then another one is not available, you have your artery forceps in and then you are waiting. So these kind of unpleasant situations can be avoided if we have a checklist kind of approach check everything before making a cut on the patient's body. It's important, vital, that we auscultate the chest carefully before we insert the tube because after insertion, you will auscultate again and comparison is the best way to know what has been the result of your chest tube insertion. Chest tubes are available in different, different shapes. So they are available as simple tubes, as you would see on your screen on the, uh, in the middle, uh, second from the left is the most commonly used straight kind of a tube. On the extreme left is an angled tube. In the middle is a malicot, which I have shown only to say that today, when these kind of tubes are freely available across the country, I, I hope they are available at most of the places. So there is no need today to be using a red rubber Melicot catheter. On the right hand side are what are known as uh, uh, the tubes with troca or uh, trocar chest tubes and they are called. Now many people use this trocar chest tube and they say that it's actually safer because you have a more a controlled kind of an entry. But trust me, friends, I have seen more complications with these stroke arch chest tubes than with the standard chest tube. So my humble suggestion would be to use the straight, uh, simple chest tube, the one you are seeing on second from extreme left. The angle tube are actually left by cardiac surgeons and they often use it after cardiac surgery. Often asked question is about the size of the chest tube. Now, please look at the bottom of the slide. Smaller the chest tube, less the pain it will cause. Because after all, the chest tube is there in the, is passing through your two ribs, between the two ribs and chest tube is growing. So it's actually touching the, the nerves there. It does cause pain and therefore, smaller the chest tube, the better it is. Usually, in adults, we use about 28 or 32. It will also depend on what you are draining. If it's a clear fluid, a small, if it's air, smallest size will do. If it's clear fluid, uh, even a smaller tube will do. But if you have a lot of thick debris in the pus or a blood is there, maybe a larger size chest tube. The general rule around 28 size in adult males, around 24 size in adult females about 16 size for children and about 12 size for newborns, but this could be very, but remember smaller the chest tube, less will be the pain. These are the various chest tubes available. Now this is what I call a procedure set, which should be available. As you would see starting from the left, it has a sponge holder. It has a scalpel handle with a 15 or 11 number plate. It has two long artery forceps for insertion. It has a tissue forceps. It has a needle holder and suture cutting scissors. And last but not the least, most important, it has a skin fixation suture, which should be preferably a number one silk on a 
curved cutting needle now this is the part which is often missed you have all the instruments available you put the chest tube when it comes to fixing it suddenly you realize oh there is no suture in the board so then the nurse goes running to the ot to get it or she gets a suture with a round body needle and then you are struggling to put it through the so it's important to have this checklist and a curved cutting needle will help you in fixing it properly a very important slide where should it be put when i say where there are two wares one is location in the ward in the ot where and site is the site of insertion now let's come to the first issue that is location whether it should be put in the ward in the outdoor in minor ot major ot now let me tell you that chest tube being inserted in the chest has as much chance of introducing infection in the chest as you would do when you operate on a chest because you are invading and you are going inside the chest so to my mind the aseptic measures which need to be taken are the same that you would take when you are doing actually a procedure now so my humble appeal is whether you do it in the ward or you do it in the ot please give it the importance please give asepsis the importance that it deserves as if you were doing a thoracotomy or a proper procedure please do not think oh i am only putting a small tube so what and i can do without asepsis no you are entering into the chest of the patient and if you do it in an unsterile way you will convert a simple pleural effusion into an empyema for which the patient will have to pay a heavy price so please as you can see in this picture Uh, the person has scrubbed his hands properly he has put on a proper gown i would recommend even if you do it in the ward we don't always do in the ot often times we do it in the ward but even in the ward we get a set a drape set and a gown set from the ot we ask the residents to scrub properly put on a sterile gown mask cap put on the gloves in the same way as you do in the ot and then you proceed with the procedure it may take 5 10 minutes extra time but trust me you are doing a big service or you are not doing this service to the patient if you avoid taking this steps take a shortcut and introduce infection i think it's not right next question which intercostal space and where in the chest well the exact site will depend on the location of the pathology but the commonest site is the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line earlier it was believed that air can only be drained through an anteriorly placed chest tube in the second intercostal space so if there is a hemo pneumo or a hydro pneumothorax it was recommended that you put one tube in the mid axillary line and another one in the mid clavicular line the current knowledge is that the tube inserted through the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line will be equally effective for draining air also you don't always have to put a second tube in the inter in the mid clavicular line now you should be careful that a too medially placed tube may injure internal mammary artery if you go too medially you can cause that and in cases of loculated effusion it's always important vital that you do it under ultrasound gun now safe triangle is what we refer to as the site preferred site of putting a chest tube which is an area bordered by the anterior border of lat dorsi the lateral border of pec major a line superior to the horizontal level of the nipple and having apex towards the axilla it's the usual site it usually corresponds to the fifth or sixth space in the mid axillary line the next issue what should be the position of the patient well you can put the tube with patient in supine position patient in sitting position as you can see in the picture on the right or even in lateral position the most preferred is supine position and as you can see in the picture on the left the hand is taken towards the back side so you have the whole chest exposed to you if you due to some reason choose to do it in sitting position please make the patient comfortable as you can see we have put a mayo stand there is a below over that over which the patient can sit comfortably and be comfortable you can't have a patient sitting unsupported and you putting a chest tube it will be very uncomfortable and unpleasant for the patient as i said earlier 
all aseptic precautions need to be taken and please look at the area on which the iodine has been put i would do a pre cleaning we will ask the patient to clean up that area if there is lot of dirt is there then we will do first time cleaning and then we paint with iodine going to quite wide area just the way we do in the operative procedure and as you can see there is a sterile towel which has been placed behind the patient and then we drape the area just as we do in surgery so that all the sides are covered with sterile drape now many times friends i have seen just one towel being put on the inferior side and then superiorly medially laterally everything is exposed there's no way you can avoid your gloves touching the unsterile area and you end up reaching the asepsis that's not correct that's not the right way please do get extra drapes and please see that this area is covered properly next step comes a local analgesia it's important that you first choose the site okay this is the site in which i'm i'm putting the chest tube you raise a skin wheel properly but before you do that please warn the patient that i'm going to put a, uh, an, uh, an injection you will have pain but after this you will have a painless procedure allay the anxiety and then go slowly deeper deeper into the muscles and you will reach up to the pleura it's important that you deposit some local anesthesia in the pre pleural space also because pleura is the most sensitive space more many and, and this local should be given over a wide area so that not only at the site of incision but the area surrounding is also uh, uh, and is, and uh, has analgesia many times in a very anxious patient you can complement it by given intercostal space analgesia a space above same space and a space below which will give you analgesia over a wide area it's important that after giving the local anesthesia you wait for few minutes for the effect to occur because if you make an cut immediately if once the patient feels pain then his anxiety level goes up so much that every time you move towards him it start jumping even if he's not having pain now it's important that before you give a cut after and i would do this between the time i have given local and uh, i give the next cut that you have all your things uh, arranged here so as you can see this is a ready made kind of bottle that we use but there are all kinds of bottles available whichever one you choose so first of all a chest tube of proper size should be available there i would always keep a chest tube extra spare by the side by chance if this was to fall or something was to happen you should have a spare available but more importantly i will have the bottle opened whichever one you are using the saline put in the in the bottom as you can see here saline has been put the tube has been cut to enough length so that it's ready to be connected so i would keep the bottle ready to be connected ready at the bed side so that as soon as my tube is in i can connect this bottle numerous times the tube is inserted and then you start the process acha sister please now get the bottle then she'll go to get the bottle this should be avoided you should be ready with the bottle to be connected with so next points in in inserting the chest tube is you give an incision you do muscle and pleural puncture the entry should be guarded and you should avoid any internal injury which is an important area i'm coming to and then you avoid any air aspiration by asking the patient to stop breathing you hold the chest tube correctly which direction to go how much length to put how to take the suture how to put dressing these are important points and let us look at each of them carefully now a large number of complications have been encountered during this simple chest tube insertion procedure which include from injury to neurovascular bundle in the intercostal space to injury to lung parenchyma injury to thoracic aorta injury to heart diaphragm the needle the the uh, chest tube or the artery process going downwards into the peritoneal structures injury to liver spleen stomach colon all these are described and unfortunately i have myself seen experienced and managed all these problems so these can be avoided now injury to neurovascular bundle 
can be avoided if you remember the anatomy that the neurovascular bundle runs at the inferior margin of the rib above. So instead of going closer to the inferior margin of the rib above, if you go closer to the superior margin of the rib below, which is towards the inferior side of the intercostal space, now that's the way to avoid injury to neurovascular bundle. Now, as far as lung is concerned, the commonest reason why lung injury occurs is that when you are making the puncture, you don't keep your artery forceps guarded with the other hand, you just puncture. So initially there is the resistance and as soon as the resistance gives way, just like we have this problem in very needle insertion also, the artery forceps goes in and it goes and hits into the lung. It can, if it's a long Kelly, sometimes it can injure, especially on the left side, it can injure the heart. There have been reports of aortic injury, esophageal injury, and sometimes it goes towards the diaphragm, punctures the diaphragm and goes into liver or spleen. And especially in trauma cases, if there is a diaphragmatic rupture and your stomach and colon are lying in the chest, you can actually end up doing a gastrostomy or colostomy while putting a chest tube. So one has to be aware and follow some very basic principles, which I'm coming to in the next few slides. Another point is to avoid pulmonary edema and I'm coming to, I'll discuss this point in the subsequent side. So having given the local, you before making cut, please check that local anesthesia is adequate and patient is not having pain. Regarding the cut, many people have a tendency of making a long cut and they feel comfortable. Now, if you give a long cut, you will have to put those many stitches and oftentimes the chest tube is blue. So I would say that your cut should be just a few millimeter more than the size of the chest tube that you are going to put so that your, your pursing suture will be able to adequately cover it, fit snugly around the chest tube. So you give a skin and subcutaneous tissue cut and then you take an artery forceps and try and open the, the chest wall muscles till you slowly, slowly reach up to the pleura. Now slowly, when you, you don't try to have a mass puncture in one go, that should always be avoided. Slowly open the muscles in the same direction, keep going deeper and deeper till you reach pleura. When you reach pleura, you will have the same feeling that you would have if you were to take a balloon filled with water and you try and puncture it with the artery posture. Now that kind of a feeling you get once you reach pleura, that's the most crucial step to puncture the pleura. And that is why the guarded approach is important. As you can see here, the right hand is holding the artery forceps, but the left hand is holding, is guarding the artery forceps. So I would fix a distance that, okay, about, I want the artery forceps to go maybe about two centimeters or one centimeter, depending on the thickness of the chest wall, I would only allow the artery process to go this much. So I put my left hand's index finger at that space and then I try to push the artery process in so that even if there is a sudden loss of resistance, the artery process only goes that much and doesn't go completely into the chest. It's the same principle that we follow in various needle insertion also to avoid a complete entry into the abdomen. Once you have pumped, you have gone into, into the chest, then you just open it at one angle and open it at right angle. So now you will have a proper size. This is like dilatation, just making enough opening. Don't try to make a very big opening because if you have a very big opening, there is increased chance of peritubal leakage in the post-op period. And while you are doing it, it's important to ask the patient to stop breathing. Otherwise, as soon as you puncture, if the patient is breathing, they will suck in more air. The next step is how to hold, having made the hole, ask the patient to stop breathing, how to hold the tube correctly. Now, as you would see here, the artery forceps or the kelly's which I'm using is not protruding beyond the chest tube. It's just stopping few millimeters short of the chest tube. So it will act as a trocar to put the chest tube, but at the same time, in the inside, by chance, if lung was to be closed, what will hit the lung is the chest tube and not the uh, artery forceps. So it's important that you hold it in such a way that your artery, force, your artery forceps is few millimeter before the end of the chest tube and chest tube end is protruding. Now, what direction? 
it's important because once the tube goes in it is your artery fossa which will direct which way it will go you might like to direct it downwards in the retro in the uh, posterior recess you know that that the tip of the tube lying in the paravertebral space that's the commonest position that we aspire for but sometimes you might like to direct it upwards towards the apex so that you have to decide beforehand and accordingly the artery forceps will actually direct so whichever direction if you want to direct cranially your artery forceps and the tube will be directed cranially but normally you like to direct it towards the paravertebral gutter so you will go in that direction so that the tube ultimately when you push it in it goes in that direction so direction of the tube is important equally important is how much of length of the tube to insert many times people go in and then they insert the whole tube and then try to pull it out no you have to beforehand decide that okay this is so this is my incision i want to place the chest tube in a uh, in in the posterior recess ending somewhere near the paravertebral gutter okay this is the width of the chest which i my chest tube needs to travel so i will say okay this is so many centimeters so my chest tube will go this much or else maybe i want to go towards the apex okay i want my tip to lie here somewhere here then this is the length that i have that so you please decide which direction you want to go how much length you want to be in and accordingly you put that much of tube so that you have excess enough length going in and not too much of length going in otherwise later on it will be problem once you have put the chest tube i mean patient cannot hold breath for a long time so as soon as your tube is in i think either you yourself or if you have somebody assisting you should take a gauze piece put the gauze piece around the tube press it so that there is no possibility of any air aspiration from here and let the patient take deep breaths before you do a first string or any other procedure so this is important because otherwise unnecessarily some air will get sucked in of course the air will come out later but at the same time you should try avoiding any possible aspiration and as i said the tube will be the bottle etc will be ready so you are ready to connect this as soon as the tube has been inserted so you can see here the tube has been put and we have just connected so the blood or fluid or air whatever it is it starts draining now after you have inserted the chest tube you have inserted in the desired direction you have inserted the desired length of the chest tube inside the next and you have given time for the patient to breathe by for blocking this with a gauze piece and patient is now comfortable the next step is to take a first string suture if your skin incision is small usually one proper first string suture will suffice but if you have made a big incision then maybe apart from first string you may have to take one or two extra sutures also now it's important that your first string is tight around the tube and you can check that by trying to move the tube when this suture the uh, the stitch has been taken the knot has been tied there should be no movement of the tube here so skin should be fitting snugly if there is any movement of the tube here be sure you will have peritubal leak in the uh, post insertion period so once you have done that then you put you take the suture around the tube to keep it anchored and finally you put this knot here so now you have your chest tube adequately anchored to the skin uh, and not in a position to come out the next step now is to put a sterile dressing around it now remember this is an area which is sterile and if you put a dressing like plaster gynoplast whatever directly those are not sterile things so therefore you have to be careful that you put a sterile dressing around it so earlier we used to put a gauze piece around it and over the gauze piece we used to put the plaster but many times this plaster used to come in contact with this area from where the tube is entering and i thought the inside of the plaster is not sterile so what i do now is to take a little bit of this cotton now this may not be many people might object but this is how i do it that i just take some cotton and little tincture benzoin 
And first, we just put this tincture benzoin soap cotton around the tube. What it does is it sticks, you know, if you, if you leave it for some time, it sticks to the skin and it forms a very nice, uh, snugly fitting layer around the entry point of the tube. The next thing we do, we take a sterile dressing. Now, this is a Tegaderm dressing. Any of these sterile dressing usually available for IV site uh, uh, dressing, you can take and you put it around the chest tube at this point. As you can see, we put one this side and one this side. So from here to here, this chest tube entry point is sealed in a sterile manner. Now I'll put a gauze piece around it, cut gauze piece around it, and then I put plaster. Half cut from comes from one side, the other half comes from the other side, and you take a flag kind of thing, which could be going this way or going across. This will keep the tube anchored to the skin. Whether you use Dynaplast or use Micropore or you use plaster, that's your choice. But it's important that you have initial covering of a sterile dressing so that this area is now going to remain sterile as long as this dressing will be in place. It's a small but I think important step. And then we have gauze piece and the plaster. Now, another important thing which we have learned uh, along the way is that many times people used to have just this dressing and this tube will be hanging down connected to the bottle. Now, many times during shifting, etc., there is a pull that causes pain to the patient and sometimes there could be inadvertent pulling out the tube. So now we've started this what we call secondary strapping that we give a little loop of chest tube here and then another area where dynaplast or plaster or something fixes. And another important point as you would see here is that the junction of chest tube and the collecting bottle, we put a plaster because numerous times we've had this issue of slipping of the tube and suddenly the chest tube is lying open. So it's important to secure this junction and then you can secure this chest tube to the side. Now, now if there is any pull, suppose patient is being shifted, patient is moving, patient is doing exercises. If there is any pull, the pull will be at this point and not at the insertion point because the insertion point pull causes pain to the patient apart from the possibility of inadvertent pull out. Another small but I think important point. Now, as I was saying, it's important to put a proper purse string suture. See what happens if the purse string suture is not done properly. This is image from one of my own patients chest tube put by one of my team members. The purse string suture was loose. So there was some blood seeping around the chest tube. They informed the sister. Sister put more dressing, more dressing, more dressing. But the dressing is not the answer. Dressing will not control it. It will in only conceal it. The answer is to remove all this dressing, clean it, and then put a proper purse string. So unless you have a proper snugly fitting purse string, your leakage, peritubal leakage can always be a problem. Many times you will have surgical emphysema occur, occurring in patients, particularly patients with pneumothorax. Now, if your tube is draining adequately, I think there is no need to worry. It is normally a self-limiting process. The chest, you have to make sure that the holes of the tube, the commonest cause due to which you get subcutaneous emphysema is that the tube has slipped out and one of the holes of the chest tube is actually lying in the subcutaneous tissue. So air keeps slipping from there. So then the chest tube needs to be removed and a fresh chest tube needs to be put. We usually do not recommend insertion or putting it in of the same chest tube because the outside portion of the chest tube is unsterile. The other reason could be that maybe there is a blockade in the tube or there is too much of air being leaked from inside and one tube is not enough, in which case you should go for a second tube to be put, which could be in the second or third intercostal space mid clavicular line. Another, uh, some photos to see that if, you know, you don't take the technique properly here, there was some clotting problem with the patient. So you can see a big hematoma. Here, the leakage of the fluid around the chest tube has led to a big collection around the breast. And this patient 
the chest tube dressing was put and not changed for about a month and you can see what kind of excoriation just a small small points that you have to check the clotting part carefully you have to be very careful with uh, snugly fitting um, per string around the tube and of course the dressing etc have to be taken here the next important step is how to connect what kind of water seal so when i was resident at that time we used to have this bottle the saline bottle in which uh, uh, two tubes glass tubes were put one was going under water and other one was in the air chamber nowadays i think most of the places we have these ready made bottles available which could be single chamber or double chamber and of course some places bags are also used now bags are okay the only problem with bags is in case you need to apply suction there is no way you can apply suction on the bag and many a time there is the problem of slippage of the bag and the bag becomes flat and then your underwater part goes away so i would personally recommend using one of these ready made bottles it's important that you prepare the bottle properly all these bottles have very very long kind of connecting tube and if you leave a very long loop of tube especially lying on the floor it actually forms a pressure head against which the air or fluid has to come out so i always check the distance that okay if i'm keeping on the floor and here is the patient lying on the bed this is the length required leave a 6 to 8 inches extra for movement of the patient and your tube should be coming straight now whatever fluid or air comes in this tube will go straight into the bottle if you have a this kind of a loop or a long loop or multiple loop there will be more resistance to the flow of air or water and it will not come out completely now after you have inserted the chest tube and you settled all the things the first thing you should do is to auscultate the patient's chest you have auscultated before insertion you should auscultate immediately after insertion and you would find that the air entry now definitely should be better because the air or fluid would have been drained uh, it's always important to do a chest x ray sometime as soon as the patient is stable to be able to document that yes whatever reason i put it for whether it was fluid or blood or air it has now drained now how much to drain if there is too much of fluid inside uh, and lung has been collapsed for some time if you put a tube and you drain the entire fluid completely and the lung expands suddenly sometimes patients can go into pulmonary edema what is known as re expansion pulmonary edema so it's always important to let the lung expand slowly so if you have a massive effusion and lung has been collapsed for a long time it's important that you initially drain about a liter then clamp it for few hours drain another 5 600 800 800 cc after 4 to 6 hours clamp it again clamp it and do it in alicots of about 5 6 to 700 cc at a time and slowly slowly also keeping a watch on the hemodynamics of the patient because sometimes sudden drainage of a large amount of fluid especially in a hypovolemic patient can actually lead to hypotension also another very vital piece which is often neglected is pain relief you put chest tube for some chest condition for the lungs to get well it's vital that the patient takes a deep breath and patient will only take a deep breath if taking deep breath is not causing him pain if taking a deep breath is causing him pain patient will not take deep breath and that will only come if you give pain relief many times we feel oh it's a small procedure i have given one tablet of prosin that should be enough please be liberal with pain killers it's important to give liberal doses of oral or parenteral pain killer have the patient pain free and make him do breathing exercises because your aim is to have your lung expanded and lung will only expand if the patient takes a deep breath and does exercise now i have found bedside sit up to be a very good although a very crude but very good exercise i just ask the patient to come. of course you have to ensure that he is hemodynamically stable and not suffering from any knee or spine problem but having ensured that i just sit down myself by the side of the by the by the bedside and say okay do like this please sit down get up sit down get up few times you have 
patient breathless. So you can start with a small number and slowly improve or we have a treadmill also in our unit. So making him walk on the floor, making him go up and down the stairs, making him do sit-ups or send to your physiotherapy, whichever method you use. But it's important to have the patient moving about. It's not right to have the patient in the bed because a bedridden patient will retain secretions and the lung will not expand completely. Trust me, for proper lung expansion, pain relief, patient movement and breathing exercises are vital. And whether you want to use painkillers orally or you want to use something more, that's your choice. And let me tell you that there is no, many times uh, we have this notion, oh, uh, chest tube should only require a uh, crocin twice a day, nothing more than that. Why should he need more than that? Well, friends, everybody has a different pain threshold. Idea is not, end point is not how much painkiller you have given. End point is patient should be pain relief. Person A may be pain relieved with one tablet of crocin for 24 hours. Well, good. Person B may need an injectable dose given twice to achieve the same level of pain relief after the same procedure. So please don't be rigid about how much to give. Please pay attention to the end point. And the end point is a completely pain relief patient. Now, the bottom part of the slide is about epidural catheter. Now, a chest tube insertion obviously does not need an epidural catheter. Uh, oral or intramuscular uh, painkillers will be more than enough. But I have shown this epidural slide, especially because many of the colleagues will be dealing with chest trauma patients. And many of these patients have multiple rib fractures. Now, most painful condition in the body is when you have multiple rib fractures. You're breathing 20, 25 times every minute. And every time you breathe, the lip, rib ends move, they clash with each other and the patient has excruciating pain. So what they do, they make the chest tight. The, there is no movement on that side. They just refuse to cough. So they retain their secretion. There's no air going to that side. And ultimately, three, four days later, these patients end up with a complete collapse of lung on the uh, side of trauma or on both sides. And then they go on ventilator. This is something we are seeing very often. And that's where in the last 20 years, epidural catheter has made a huge difference. So if you have a patient who's got multiple rib fractures, particularly if it's bilateral, please do request your anesthesia colleagues to put an epidural catheter. You can give twice a day injections or if you have facility as we have, uh, you can see on the bottom right picture, this is the pain pump, which actually keeps giving continuous dose of NLG6 to the epidural, giving a 24-7. There is a button which patient can press. So we can give a continuous dose and there is a top of facility also. So I'm not at all suggesting epidural for any chest tube insertion. Chest tube insertion pain is to be managed with oral or parenteral NLG6. But if you have a chest trauma patient who's got multiple rib fractures and you are managing, you put a chest tube. Now, this is a situation where adequate pain relief with the help of epidural will not only allow the patient to breathe well, but you will also be able to make him do physiotherapy, which will bring out all the secretions and let him have a completely expanded lung. Time and again, we see when the patient presents, they have a proper expanded lung and fourth day the lung collapses because of retention of secretions. Afterwards, milking of chest tube. So if there is a lot of blood or something collecting, you have to keep emptying that. Now, sometimes when we don't recommend suction devices routinely, I would only recommend that you connect the chest tube to an underwater drainage bottle and have the fluid draining. But sometimes if the lung does not expand, there could be in specific situations role for a negative suction device. There are various types of devices available. There are these digital portable devices from Medla company, which we are using routinely, or there are various other suction devices available, which can be connected to the wall suction. And you can have variable amounts of suction and the flight. But I'm not recommending routine use of suction devices. These are to be used in specific situations. Now, a very important practical point is daily emptying of the bottle. Now, this is a point which is usually left 
either to nurses who some of whom may not be aware or many times i share my experience at uh, at my previous place where nurses actually used to give it to the sweeper in the ward so what he used to do he used to open the bottle and just hang the uh, the the inside part or make the relatives hold it and go and empty it now please this is a sterile system and this system needs to be emptied in a sterile way so when you open the bottle when you are emptying the bottle when you are putting the inside part back into the bottle or when you are putting saline into the bottle at all these steps friends sterility has to be maintained so now in my unit it's a clear cut instruction that these are only done by nurses under supervision of one of the <coughs> residents they don't do it ever alone if they have to empty they will call one of the doctors and they do in front it's a small step but trust me a lot of time a sepsis is broken in this step and then you can have ascending infection going into the chest now many times these patients will be shifted for x ray or for other reasons and while shifting the patient it's not uncommon to see the chest tube getting pulled out i have faced this problem i'm sure many of you would have faced so this secondary strapping helps prevent that and the other thing is the resident or sister whoever is shifting have to be careful that the clothes should be removed the tube the collecting system should be visible before you shift the patient as i said i stress a lot on mobility of the patient so patient a mobile patient will have much less chest complication so whether it is the portable suction device or it is the pain pump which is hanging it's important to have patient mobile doing exercises some of these patients will be suffering from chronic illness sometimes and they may not be able to eat adequately because of various reasons similarly if you have a polytrauma patient and the patient has abdominal injury he may not be able to eat so if few days have passed by it's important that for long term recovery you take care of the nutrition also and we utilize rice tube feeding quite regularly so within a day or two if patient is not able to go back to or normal oral feeds we put a rice tube and give them about 2000 to 2500 calorie high protein liquid diet made in the hospital through the rice tube and this can be continued even when the patient so please pay attention to nutrition and to mobility of the patient now after you have put chest tube you have to auscultate and see that there is improved air entry you do a chest x ray and you see that the lung is expanded but sometimes you do a chest x ray and you find that the lung is not expanding now this cannot be left like that you put a chest tube lung does not expand it needs further work up now what are the possibilities maybe your chest tube is blocked so then you please check the chest tube you ask the patient to take a deep breath and see whether there is movement of the column with respiratory movement ask the patient to cough and see if the underwater seal the the level of water in the in the seal is moving that will tell you whether the chest tube is patent or not suppose you have ensured that the chest tube is patent that the lung is still not expanding then that means there is some kind of a blockage to air coming to the lung now that could be a commonest cause is retained secretions in the main bronchus forming a mucus plug or who knows there might be a tumor lying there or who knows there may be lung has been collapsed for quite some time and a peel has formed around the lung which has not allowed this lung to expand so you will need to do a ct or you will need to do a bronchoscopy to see by bronchoscopy if there is a mucus plug you will be able to suck out the mucus plug this problem we see often in trauma patients that despite chest tube lung doesn't expand you go in and do bronchoscopy there was a big mucus plug you suck out the mucus plug and immediately the lung expand so long and short of the story is that if you have put the chest tube and the chest tube is patent and within 24 to 20 12 to 24 hours of insertion of a chest tube if lung does not expand you cannot just wait and hope that it will do so on its own you need to do something more and bronchoscopy or ct is the next step to find out what is the cause of that now you have put the chest tube you maintained it adequately you 
taken care of all the drainage and everything lung is fully expanded patient is recovered now a time has come to remove the chest tube when do you remove the chest tube what are the prerequisites well uh, first of all the lung should be fully expanded you cannot remove a chest tube if the lung is not yet fully expanded so clinically you will auscultate and you will do a chest x ray and ensure that the lung is fully expanded there should be no air leak for more than 24 hours obviously if there is air leak present and you remove the chest tube the lung will collapse again now why this 24 hours period numerous times we've noticed that you ask the patient to cough and there is no air leak but few hours later you ask the patient to cough there might be a bubble or two coming out so that's why we give this 24 hours time that if there is any leaking point we just want to give enough time because the last thing you want to do is to go back and re need to reinsert the tube. There should be no fresh blood coming from the chest tube. There should be no altered blood coming. If you have dark altered blood coming, that means something is still there or you have pus coming, then you can't remove the chest tube. Drainage is variable. It will also depend on the body size. If you have a short statured patient, 100 cc and if you have a tall patient maybe up to 200 cc so anything between 100 to 200 cc per day i would remove the chest tube but the prerequisites are number one the lung should be fully expanded as seen clinically and confirmed on chest x-ray there should be no air leak there should be no fresh blood no altered blood no pus and the drainage is around 100 cc or so now patient position while you remove the chest tube again you have to do it in the supine position again as in insertion it's important to explain to the patient what you are going to do and rehearse it several times so what i do is to i open the stitch and i just move the tube little bit there so that they would know what kind of pain they are going to to experience if your chest tube has been there for a long time many times the skin around that becomes excoriated and your first string if you try to tie does not hold does not close the hole. In that case, it is better to take a gauze piece and provide, just pull out the tube and cover that area with a gauze piece and put an occlusive dressing because if you try and tighten that spur string, it will cut through. But if it's been there only for about five, seven days, it will be possible. So you pull out the tube and side by side, you tighten the purse string so that the air does not go inside. But important thing again is to explain to the patient and if you can manage to give some local to the patient trust me you will have a lot of cooperation from the patient again after removal of the chest tube so you before you remove the chest tube you auscultate after you have removed the chest tube you again auscultate that there is no decrease in the air entry you do a chest x-ray after patient goes home it's important to tell them to continue to do the breathing exercises the pain relief part has to continue. You have to talk to them about what movement. There is a general belief, oh, he has had a tube inserted. He must go and lie down on the bed. So numerous times we have seen patients going home and not moving at all. So you have to give these instructions that, okay, now you are allowed normal movement. You have to tell them when they have to come for dressing removal, when they have to come for stitch removal. And of course, if there is any underlying disease, the definitive treatment has to be given. Sometimes after removal of the chest tube, you have patient has taken a breath and some air has gone inside. What do you do? You do a chest x-ray, you auscultate, you find there's a slight decrease in the air entry, do a chest x-ray, you find the x-ray has shown some pneumothorax. What do you do? Well, first of all, you have to see whether the patient is comfortable or patient is in distress. If the patient is comfortable, and your chest x-ray reveals the pneumothorax to be occupying less than one third of the horizontal uh, uh, size of the chest, then you can probably observe. Don't discharge the patient, don't send him home because if he goes home and this increases, he will have to rush to casualty in an emergency situation. Keep him in the hospital, observe, auscultate frequently, maybe repeat a chest x-ray the next day. And if you show, if the patient continues to be well, and an x-ray shows reduction in the amount of pneumothorax, you can then send the patient home. But remember, any patient who becomes symptomatic, who's dyspneic after chest tube removal because of uh, pneumothorax, or you do serial chest x-rays and you see, you show that the pneumothorax is increasing. So it was one third, next day more than half of lung is correct. This patient definitely needs a reinsertion of the chest tube. A few words about loculated pleural occlusion. 
if you have loculated pleural effusion as a particular area in olden times we used to do a pa and lateral chest x-ray localize it and then try and put a chest tube that's not done anymore ultrasound is freely available in fact a lot of surgical units across the country now have access to ultrasound otherwise you seek help from your radiology colleague and all loculated pleural effusion should be drained under ultrasound guidance now it could be done there you want to do it you take the patient to radiology suite ask them to do an ultrasound tell them to give the best accessible window try and inject i mean aspirate there with a needle or benplon and mark the site okay this is the site you can bring the patient back to your ward or ot and put the chest tube there or nowadays most of the radiology suites are equipped to put this but trust me the asepsis in the radiology suite may not be uh, as much as you would like to have so given a choice bring the patient back uh, and then put the chest tube or else ensure that the asepsis is adhered to in the radiology suite and they can put whether they put a, put a, a pigtail catheter or a bigger size chest tube will depend on what it is if it's just fluid or air a pigtail will suffice but if it's a pus which has some uh, ecogenic material inside it's better to put a 24 size chest tube which your radiologist colleagues will be able to put uh, one very important point when not to clamp the chest tube many times i have seen when the patients are being transferred from one bed to another from ward to radiology suite or whether there's other places there is a tendency the first thing the sisters will do is to put an artery clamp on the chest tube well friends when patients are on positive pressure ventilation or continuous positive airway pressure which is which means cpap or they are having an air leak so whether at the time of changing bottles or tubing, whether during nursing procedures, whether for physiotherapy or during transportation, please do not clamp the chest tube. If the patient is having an air leak and you clamp the chest tube, you are inviting tension pneumothorax, especially if the patient is on ventilator. So any patient with air leak present, no clamping of chest tube except for briefest possible period if you're trying to empty the bottle or some such thing is being done but otherwise do not clamp the chest tube unfortunately very simple very basic step but often neglected and i have seen tension pneumothorax developing because of this now during transportation i see no reason why tube should be clamped most of the trolleys these days have a, a, a jolly or something under the bed and the bottle can always be kept or they have a hook by which it could be hung by the side of the trolley so continuous drainage is the safest approach of course when changing the icd bottles clamp the tube for shortest possible period another very important point the last two two, two lines ensure that the drainage bottles are kept at a lower level than the chest because many times I have seen the patients will pick up the bottle and they take it at a level higher than the point from which the chest tube is entering and the fluid can actually go back. So please explain to them that this bottle at all times is to be kept down. Now complications, as I said, from hematoma at the insertion site, injury to neurovascular bundle, injury to lung, injury to heart, aorta, esophagus, diaphragm, liver, spleen, colon, stomach, all these have been described from simple to life threatening but friends i feel if you adhere to the basic principle that okay this is the site where it should be inserted these are the basic steps the most important is when you are putting the artery forceps inside if you have your other hand guarding the entry of the artery forceps i think a lot of these problems can be avoided so i would conclude by just reiterating some of the important points it's very important to take consent from the patient it's very important to explain to the patient what you are going to do it's vital that you pay attention to asepsis please remember you are entering the patient's chest and you have as much chance of giving him empyma if you don't adhere to asepsis as you have if you were to do a preparatory Please have a checklist and ensure that all items are available at the bedside or in the ward before you make a cut.
proper position is important the person who does this should have experience or if somebody new is starting he should have an experienced person assisting him proper fixation of the tube is important otherwise you will have fluid leaking around the tube which will be unpleasant for the patient and unpleasant for you now how much to drain at a time is important and in massive effusions please do not drain the entire amount otherwise sudden lung re expansion will lead to re expansion pulmonary edema it's vital that you auscultate before insertion and auscultate after insertion and do a chest x ray after insertion and document complete expansion of the lung if the lung is not expanded within 24 to 48 uh, uh, 12 to 24 or up to maybe 36 to 48 hours after insertion of the chest tube please check whether the chest tube is patent or not and if it is patent you need to see why air is not coming to the lung it could be mucus plug or something else and it needs to be taken care of so bronchoscopy or ct is the answer now maintenance of the tube daily emptying is an important step which should not be left to the sweepers it has to be done in a sterile manner pain relief is of vital importance if you don't pain relief the patient he will not breathe and he will have many complications particularly chest infection in long term patient nutrition is important if the patient is not able to take oral orally please do not hesitate to put a rice tube lot of patients have been saved by putting rice tube and force feeding them and later on as their general condition improves they their appetite improves now when where and how to remove the chest tube we have discussed it please follow these principles but always look out for post removal pneumothorax and act if the patient is comfortable wait otherwise reinsert the chest tube pain relief is important exercise is important nutrition is important but of course chest tube insertion is just one part of management if the patient has some other problem definitive treatment for that problem is also equally important friends i would conclude my presentation by saying that it's actually every patient's right i would say to have the chest tube inserted which is a basic procedure like tracheostomy uh, chest tube inserted in a safe manner maintained in a safe manner and removed in the safe manner just as we do for other things and i think it's a duty of every doctor not just chest physician or physician or a pediatrician or surgeon it's a duty of every doctor to be able to put a chest tube safely so let us all join hands and achieve safe insertion of chest tube now this talk which i have given is also available on the youtube and i have uh, put the link here uh, this can be seen anybody who has missed out can actually see it at the youtube also thank you very much friends from across the country uh surgeons pediatricians physicians chest physicians and any other specialist who has joined on behalf of association of surgeons of india on behalf of lvm i thank you from the bottom of my heart for sparing your valuable time and being part of this discussion i would also thank professor malik for sitting through the presentation and of course now i will be quiet and dr malik will be taking charge we'll be happy to take questions from everyone as dr malik has told you there are various ways you can put it on the chat window you can whatsapp to us you can get in touch with your healthium representatives they will send the questions to us and we will be very happy to answer thank you very much So uh, small statistics. As we speak, there are more than four hundred and seventy lockets. Our estimate is that there are three thousand surgeons watching this. Well, I am informed that there are more than three thousand doctors. I would not say all yes, surgeons, yes, surgeons, yes. chest physicians, physicians, pediatricians across the country who are watching. Well, friends, thank you very much. It's a very important topic, and we really appreciate and value your participation. and we equally will value your feedbacks your criticism your suggestions thank you
<clears throat> Thank you, Professor Arvind Kumar, for a very power-packed, comprehensive, and in-depth coverage of the subject. You have given very clear guidelines about uh, how to do the procedure, how to get the best results out of it, what complications are possible, and how to avoid them. I think uh, these guidelines should help us in achieving the most optimum outcome for the patients who present to us with an indication of a chest tube drainage. There are, of course, certain questions and certain uh, clarifications sure. that the uh, audience has sought. I may not be able to name each one of them, and I'll moderate these uh, questions according to uh, <coughs> uh, a manner that the gist of it goes to sure. you. And without naming the persons, because sure. you know, I think some of the questions are quite overlapping. And also to the audience, I would like to mention that some of the questions were generated during the time when Professor Kumar was in the early part of his uh, presentation. So they were covered up in the later part of his uh, presentation. So necessarily those questions may not, will yeah. not be addressed yeah. again. Uh, one question that has come up is that would you uh, always aim at fifth intercostal space or would you change uh, other than of course the situation of a uh, insisted or uh, loculated collection would it be always a fifth space or you would change it depending upon the habitus of the patient the sex of the patient that's one question people have uh, you know um, quite a few of them have addressed these questions too yeah so uh if I look at all the chest tube insertions, the commonest indication with us has been a pleural effusion. And most of the times it's a, it's a generalized pleural effusion. And if you want to drain this fluid, fifth space mid axillary line provides you the best portal. Of course, the fifth could be six or higher depending on the uh, position of the diaphragm. Sometimes if the diaphragm is very high placed, I might shift this fifth to the fourth space, but you don't want to go too high because if the diaphragm is normally located and you put in the fourth space, then you have a couple of spaces which are below the chest tube. And we have seen many times some amount of fluid remains in the posterior recess. So it's important that you enter and you try and have your chest tube Ideally, placed chest tube will be one which goes into the posterior recess and the tip lies just at the paravertebral gutter. If it's in the posterior recess, uh, imagine if the patient is in sitting position, the entire fluid will drain down, go into that space and get drained from the chest tube. So it will give you the best possible egress for the fluid. Of course, if it's only air that you are putting it for, you could theoretically put it in the third space in the mid clavicular line but my experience has been that many a times these patients have some fluid also accumulating at that time or later so if you put a tube in the fifth space it will not only drain the air but that fluid which may come into future but if you put it in the only mid clavicular line and then you later on you have fluid accumulating down below that fluid will not get through so i guess fifth space gives you the best fifth option. space uh, and the uh, <clears throat> mid axillary line, or would you like to be closer to the anterior fold of the uh, axilla? It is mid axillary or a little bit on this side, that side. That, of course, I will modify according to the body habitus of the patient. Also, remember, you should imagine the patient in lying down position and never have chest tube coming out uh, of the area that will be touching on the bed when the patient lies down. So sometimes I've seen chest tube being put on the back side and when the patient lies down, the tube actually gets that's pain that's because that's the that's patient that's is sleeping on the chest tube. It's so that's very, very important. That should, should not be happen. more towards the anterior it should, fold. Be, it should be in such a way that patient, when he's lying down, the chest tube is draining without any kinks and so guts. I yes. think it clearly states yeah. what should be done in this situation. Okay. Okay. We'll do that. Uh, uh, we've been told that there are too many questions, so we'll uh, sort of combine a few questions sure. and sure. Uh, keep the answer a little shorter okay. because I'll, everything has I'll been covered up very nicely. I'll keep the answer short. Uh, another I'll point see. is that directing the uh, chest tube towards the um, this uh, posteriorly in the gutter or uh, upward towards the apex. 
how do you really guide it and is it really very important to guide it or it is uh, something which is not of that importance that if you just guide it uh, towards the gutter it will take care of so, the connection as well yeah, as the yeah. so so i would guide it my as i said in the previous answer also that my ideal position is a tube lying in the posterior recess yes. with the tip being in the paraventricular area okay. if you can get your tube there it would drain fluid as well as air completely so i would but guiding is important because if you just insert say this is the this is the body of the patient and this is the hole if i insert like this the and then when i put the tube it will have a tendency to go towards the apex so initial uh, when i am holding the tube initial entry should be in that direction so so okay initial entry should be in that direction like that and then you put the chest tube so that the chest tube goes in that direction try and visualize the tube lying in the posterior diaphragmatic recess if you get your tube in the posterior diaphragmatic recess it will function in the best possible way so what <clears throat> if the tube is larger you have mentioned you know that you should visualize one should visualize you know how long the tube you like uh, you want inside if you find the tube is larger and we know that the last hole is uh, you know Uh, would be out in case you know we just have that amount of uh, tube inside so is it safe to cut the tip of the tube uh, does yeah. it does if if your tube length a uh, patient is very short you know the the width is very less and you feel that the hole by the way the the way the holes are made they are made only in the beginning part so rarely will this possibility be there that your hole will be lying outside uh, usually we have to make extra holes Uh, you know because the you want the last hole to be about an inch or so inside the parietal pleura you don't want it too close to the chest wall you want it about an inch inside the chest wall and when you make extra holes please make hole along the radio opaque line so that your chest x ray you will be able to see where is your last hole so but there certainly if you feel your hole is lying going to lie too close to your a uh, uh, chest wall you can always cut the tube and if you think too much is tube is there inside and you need to make extra holes please do make extra holes uh one po related point on the technique of insertion uh, some people have mentioned about may uh, <clears throat> after you have entered the pleura putting in the finger and uh, see uh, <clears throat> making sure that one has got into the pleural space and also taking down some of the adhesions that may be present between the lung and the uh, um, chest wall do you, do you think that this uh, part of the uh, maneuver is it a good maneuver or yeah. it should not be done or it will will it make the your incision larger and would be counterproductive excellent question so the answer is if you are putting for say a massive pleural effusion and the lung is collapsed you know that the lung has already moved away from the chest wall and there is no need to put a, a, a finger or something there but certainly if you are if you have some you know it just x ray is showing that the lung is still reaching up to the chest wall and you feel that lung could be adherent there then there is no harm in putting the finger and doing some maneuver two things i have against this putting finger one is it will necessarily need a hole bigger than the exactly. chest tube that's one and two i have found this to be extremely painful no matter how much of local you give when you put finger and you do this maneuver uh, it causes more pain uh, when you have pneumothorax and lung collapse when you have hydro or hemothorax and the lung collapse then the lung is actually away from your chest wall so the possibility of your tube injuring the lung is remote okay Uh, another point uh, like uh, when you mentioned about removal would you take uh, would you uh, like to have a pre placed a u stitch already placed at the time of insertion of the tube or would you like to take it afresh when you are pulling it out so, some people put in a pre fixed yeah, stitch yeah. so uh, our practice is that the first string that we take at the time of insertion we just tie one knot and then we wrap the uh, the two ends uh, around the tube and just leave it there under the plaster so at the time of removal we just untwist the two loose ends and our one knot is already there so some other person so first you explain to the patient that you have to take a deep breath in and hold 
and then you pull out the chest tube. What I do is to do a maneuver of moving the chest tube and see that the patient does not start breathing. Many times, the moment they have pain, they start breathing. So you have to tell them that please don't breathe, otherwise there will be problems. So you tighten the tube and the, the stitch as the chest tube is being pulled out. Now this is possible if your tube, if your stitch has been there for a week or so. But if your stitch has been there for a long time, there is usually maceration of skin around that area and then this stitch doesn't hold. Then I take a gauze piece, make a fold of it and just block that with a gauze piece. Put more gauze pieces over that and put a tight plaster to occlude that open. And uh, once you have done that, when would you finally take yeah, off so, the dressing? So, so we remove this occlusive dressing after uh, 72 hours by which time this hole actually would have closed. So if you have put a purse string, then we change the dress. We, if we have put a purse string and the purse string is very nicely closed, then you need not put an occlusive dress string. We just put a teledown or a small gauze piece and ask the patient to remove it after 48, 72 hours. And then the, this can be left open and we remove the stitch on the 8th or 10th day. But if I have not put the, uh, have been able to tie the, uh, the purse string and I put a uh, occlusive dressing there, we remove it on the fourth day. By fourth day, usually that hole would have got closed and we remove it. But if we have any doubt, we after fourth day removal changing, you put another occlusive dressing for another 48 hours, by which time the hole normally closes on its own and then there is no possibility of air being sucked in. So very nicely explained. Uh, question, which is uh, the two related question. One is that if uh, you need to reinsert the tube, what will be your side? I mean, you have taken down, uh, taken out the tube, and then uh, you know, a day or two later, you find that you have to reinsert the tube. Yeah. Where would you like? To yeah. So the you, you do not go from the same hole ever again. If you remove the chest tube and you find that there is post removal pneumothorax, you decide to observe. 48 hours later, you do a chest X-ray and find that the pneumothorax has increased or the patient is now tending to become a little bit breathless and it's time for you to reinsert. You would reinsert from a site, one space above or below, little anterior or posterior, but not from the same site. Because then you increase the chances of infection. There is increased chance of peritubal leakage because this wound will already be macerated. Uh, you have uh, nicely mentioned about how to fix the tube and I think this is very crucial. But uh, you know, uh, we have seen instances when the tube has slipped out within a day of its insertion because it was not properly fixed. In that situation, what would be your uh, advice? Yes, yeah, so the advice would be suppose the patient is being shifted somewhere and somehow the tube gets inadvertently pulled out, the resident or the nurse, whoever is there, their first response the 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 reflex should be to take a sterile gauze piece of cotton and just block that hole and put an occlusive dressing that's number one if the patient is having air leak then it's an emergency that you put the tube as quickly as possible but if the patient was not having air leak then you could take time at the most fluid will collect and then you would take the patient back to ward or theater be comfortable and put a chest tube again from a fresh site, unless it was just maybe 24, 48 hours and this wound is still fresh, then I may possibly use the same wound. But otherwise, if it's many days old, I would go for a new wound. The reason I've seen is that uh, in the beginning, when we moved here, we many patients used to come with chest tube and we put, after surgery, we put chest tubes in the same hole. But lot of infection and excoriation and stitch getting loose, those kind of problems were occurring. So we decided that when we reinsert, we would go from a fresh opening. Uh, one of the co uh, complications which can be uh, very <coughs> unnerving to a young doctor is bleeding from uh, intercostal vessel. Yeah. So if uh, that were to happen, what would be your advice to such a doctor and how to manage? Yeah, so best is to avoid these complications by just paying attention to basic steps. So if you palpate the ribs and the intercostal space and cite your cut and your entry puncture at the upper margin of the lower rib rather than at the lower margin of the upper rib, which is where the neurovascular bundle is running, I think you would avoid inadvertent injury to this. But should that happen, 
the patient may bleed outside or may bleed inside if the patient is bleeding outside well then you have no choice but you have to ship the patient to theater have proper exposure in the theater usually it may not be possible to do it under local some kind of uh, anesthesia support not saying intubation but some kind of anesthesia support is needed you have to have proper light you have to have proper asepsis you have to have all your instruments available and then you enlarge the incision a little bit see the bleeding site and underline it now if it's going inside then it would be coming out through your chest tube and you will have more than 150 200 cc per hour of blood coming in the chest tube then that becomes an indication for exploration uh, how frequent is uh, re uh, i mean exploration for such inadvertent bleedings in your long career have you encountered such situation bleedings bleedings uh, uh, i would only encounter if they occur in my setup if they were to occur in another setup they won't reach me bleeding would be something which will need to be necessarily controlled locally so therefore in my setup since it's a very controlled environment it's not common but yes i do remember uh, there have been instances where we have had to take the patients to theater and as i said if it's coming outside you have to just enlarge the incision a little bit and find out the source and suture only thing i would say blind putting stitches may not help you need to enlarge the incision proper exposure proper light ask for some help if you've done it and there's some bleeding you may be under pressure so it's nice to have your senior or somebody walk in and assist you and if it's going inside then of course it's coming out in the chest tube you won't be able to know whether it's actually intercostal bleed or it's lung bleed or which bleed then patient will probably merit an exploration uh two blocks and uh, i think it's time that you should take a gulp of water i think we've been keeping you busy no, no, it's fine i'm okay, okay. so uh two blocks at uh, any time around we put in tubes in surgery we know that they can get blocked so once that kind of situation happens uh, in an intercostal drainage in which you mentioned would be known when the air columns stops moving so uh, you have also mentioned you know what should be the post operative regimen in this patient to avoid that complication but if it were to occur what would be the uh, <coughs> options for that so here also prevention of tube blockage is the best option you know so why does the tube get blocked the tube gets blocked because there may be blood and usually it gets blocked when it actually gets kinked so the column is there and the blood clots inside if the blood is there and the blood is draining freely it will not get blocked but sometimes there could be kinking and that blood column remains inside and that gets blocked now if you have a blocked chest tube the first thing i want to tell everyone is there is no role of flushing of the chest tube please friends be very clear sometimes i have seen people taking a 20 cc syringe filling up with saline and pushing the saline i have seen people taking an aseptic syringe and connecting it and flushing you will introduce infection from outside sometimes there will be clots in the tube you could try to milk the tube hit the tube with your finger try to break those clots i have seen a continuous kind of a long clot coming out of the tube so you disconnect from the uh, the tube uh, and the connecting tube junction you block the tube here take an artery forceps hold that clot and just rotate it gently sometimes it comes out like a long snake it comes out and your tube opens up but if it doesn't you have to remove this tube and put a fresh one please do not flush a chest tube there is no role of flushing because you will 100% introduce infection from outside your chest cavity and you may not even end up opening the chest right yeah so a uh, very important uh, message that you have given there and is there any role of uh, applying intermittent uh, suction Well, in which situations after yeah, chest tube yeah. placement Excellent. you would Excellent recommend question. yeah so as a matter of routine there is no need for putting suction in every patient whether patient has pneumothorax or patient has pleural effusion or hemopneumothorax and you put a chest tube ensure that the bottle is put properly ensure that there is no kinking of the chest tube sometimes your stitch may be tight and there could be some narrowing here sometimes when you take this loop and you do Uh, the the dressing 
the angulation may be such that there is some kind of an obstruction occurring this prevents complete egress of fluid and air and leads to persistence of uh, pneumothorax or hemothorax but if you have egress completely ask the patient to cough physiotherapy is vital you know when the patient takes a deep breath and is able to breathe nicely the lung expands and lung pushes the air and fluid out of the cavity for me the single most important factor that i want to see in the chest x ray after insertion is lung expansion if the lung is expanded friends all air leaks will stop if you get complete lung expansion and there are some air minor air leaks so they are usually from the parenchyma periphery 100% of peripheral air leaks will stop if the lung is expanded because the lung goes and sticks to the chest wall and it forms a buttress there and it stops there so there is no suction but if too much of air is being produced your one tube or two tube may not suffice in this case is we put sometimes suction so whether you have so if despite drainage the lung expansion is not complete especially if you have a lot of air leaking pneumothorax to suck that out we then put chest tube also in empyema cases after surgery we use suctions routinely because many of these cases have lung collapse for a long time and even if you decorticate it takes some time for the lung to expand so we like to maintain a negative suction in the chest in those cases we do use either a digital suction or a wall suction connected to your underwater seal but routine use of suction is not that's uh, great. Uh, one uh, particular query is regarding uh, emphysema around the <coughs> insert uh, at the insertion Insert site, yes, yes. and if it is increasing yeah, in amount, yeah, yeah. is it worrisome? Yeah, and how it's to handle? excellent question. It's a very very worrisome thing, not for the doctors but for the relatives. Sometimes uh, this comes locally. Sometimes it expands, and air being light goes to the 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 anti gravity. So if the patient is sitting up, the air will come to the neck. The voice starts getting affected. Air can come to the face. The eyes, the eyes will close, and patient starts looking grotesque. The relatives are absolutely uh, in panic situation that something is going wrong, and the voice getting affected is the last thing. They want. So the first thing is to check the position of the chest tube. The commonest cause is a hole. lying in the subcutaneous tissue so please look at the chest x ray carefully and see whether the hole is lying in the subcutaneous if so that hole needs to be inside well you may ideally i would put another chest tube but if not possible then you may actually like to just clean up the area outside as i said ideally i would reinsert the chest tube i don't recommend insertion but then in this situation it may not be possible so remove the dressing clean the area around the insertion site with betadine etc and then insert so that this now lies inside ideally i say the rechest tube or else if there is lot of air leak from the lung especially in emphysematous lung and the air leaking is more than what your tube can drain then the tube air starts tracking around the tube site in that case you put another tube in the second space or third space and then we connect both the tubes through a y the y suction y cannula to a suction device so that you are able to suck out uh, more than what is being leaked from the lungs and then the uh, emphysema stops now there is a role for giving subcutaneous cuts and the ideal place for giving the subcutaneous cuts is in the infraclavicular area on both the sides i would not need to do it more than once in 2 3 years because most of the times with the uh, adequate drainage suction another chest tube tube position being checked stitches being tightened all these measures will ensure that your subcutaneous emphysema starts decreasing but if you have it making the patient uncomfortable patient has difficulty breathing face is looking grotesque then the ideal place is to put it put give cuts in the about 3 4 cm long cut in the infraclavicular area one side or both sides if it's bilateral and then roll take a pad and roll the uh, subcutaneous tissue towards that area so the air actually gets drained from there another thing to tell the relatives is that once the air has leaked into the 
a subcutaneous space. 20% is oxygen, which gets absorbed immediately. 79% is nitrogen, which takes a long time to get absorbed. And you have to tell them that this may take up to four to six weeks to resolve completely. Uh, <coughs> regarding uh, removal or, uh, <coughs> after the lung has expanded, and you mentioned that uh, if the lung has expanded, even if the fluid in the chest tube is in the range of 100 and 200 uh, cc and it is clear fluid, and uh, this is the time you can take out the, and yeah. the patient's uh, getting better. Yeah. Uh, what happens to the column in uh, this situation? Would the column keep on moving? There have been some misconception yeah. 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 that sir, the question. column has stopped Good moving. Question. Can we take it out? Good is question. it something that will happen or the column will keep moving as long as yeah. the tube so, is So what, what happens is that the column swing, as we call, depends on how much of difference in the pressure is occurring inside the chest with inspiration and expiration. Whenever you have lung fully expanded, there will be very little change in, in pressure during uh, inspiration expiration and your column swing will be minimum. Whenever after lobectomy, if the lung remaining lobe does not expand and you still have a lot of space there, then that space leads to wide changes in pressure during between inspiration and expiration and then that leads to a wide swing. So if you are seeing a wide swing in the column, it means that there is some space is still present inside. But as I said, complete lung expansion, clinically, radiologically, no air leak for more than 24 hours, no blood, no fresh blood, no altered blood, no pus, and drainage between 100 to 200 cc. That is the time we will be uh, One question has come up, and you also touched upon uh, this uh, aspect on your presentation. That was pleurodesis. So that's related to... Uh, <clears throat> intercostal drainage as a bridge to pleurodesis mm -hmm. uh, in certain patients. I believe that most of the time it's thoracoscopic, but in some situations you do a, uh, in the beginning you do a you can intercostal do drainage chest chest and subsequently you sure. go for pleurodesis. Sure. How, what is your uh, regimen? Yes, yeah, so, so pleurodesis, what you use and what regimen depends on the cause. Let's say malignant pleural effusion is one cause where we do it. So that the agents available vary from rubbing the pleura that we often do at the time of operation, especially thoracoscopic operations for pneumothorax, where the rubbed pleura, the abraded pleura, the, the lung gets adhered to that abraded pleura, to use of substances like tetracycline, which used to be available in the past, not available now, use of betadine, which the pulmonologists are very fond of using, to use of tab. Now, talc gives you the best pleurodesis. But let me clarify one very fundamental point here. What is pleurodesis? Pleurodesis is symphysis or adhesion between the visceral and the parietal pleura. So what you do, you call, you put in an agent or you do rubbing, which leads to abrasions on the parietal pleura. And when the lung is fully expanded, the visceral pleura is adherent and that inflamed surfaces join each other and that's how you get pleurotesis. So fundamental requirement for pleurotesis to be effective is lung to be expanded. This is a fundamental mistake done by a large number of people. Lung will be collapsed and they will put talc inside the chest. Oh, we have put talc to do pleurotesis. Friend, Pleurodesis is adhesion between parietal and visceral pleura. If the two pleuri are not in contact with each other, no pleurodesis can take place. So what you do use, so I suppose there is a malignant pleural effusion, I put a chest tube, fluid drains out, lung expands. Now this is time I can put talc slurry, talc mixed in saline that can be put through the chest tube. It, it gets distributed across the chest, it will cause irritation. How does it work? It causes irritation and inflammation of the pleura. Inflamed pleura get adhered to each other. Whether you use talc, whether you use rubbing, whether you use betadine or you use blood patch, whichever agent you use, the prerequisite is a fully expanded lung. Uh, you initially uh, evaluated that there is a free fluid and you put in a tube the way you have uh, described. And then at the end, you find that uh, the free fluid has drained, but there is some pocket somewhere. So uh, 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 in this situation, when would you take a call about doing another aspiration 
or would you be okay with doing a thoracocentesis for sure, that? Sure. So what will be your approach sure. to such a situation where again, the individual connection is? Again, excellent question that you, you thought it was a diffuse generalized pleural effusion. You put a chest tube, majority of the fluid has got drained, but you have an isolated pocket remaining here and there. Now, what you do depends on the clinical situation. Suppose the patient had initially presented to you with leftlessness, etc., etc., et it was thought to be tubercular effusion. You've drained it, you've done ADA and other analysis, and you feel it's tubercular effusion. Now that you put the patient on ATT, patient is fine. If it's a small collection and the patient is doing well from, uh, there's no fever, there's no rise in counts, it's not pus, it's not in infected, and the patient has no respiratory problem because of that, you may even just decide to leave it alone and follow up the patient. But if it's a large pocket, if you think it's infected, if it's causing respiratory compromise or there is some other associated issue, then I would go for an ultrasound guided, another separate pigtail or chest tube being put into this blocking uh, We are reaching towards the conclusion of this very pulsating session. Is it 5.30? No, we are reaching towards that. So we have a few more questions. <laughs> we have probably more than 65 questions. Absolutely. So uh, what is uh, the best, uh, uh, this analgesic uh, regime that you would recommend yeah. for this situation? Yeah. Would the NSAIDs be enough yeah. or would you need to upgrade the analgesic? Yeah, as a, as a, as a policy, I avoid using uh, opiate analgesics uh, in, in my patients because they make the patient drowsy and I think keeping patient fully alert, awake, participating in the recovery is more very important. Now at the same time you have to give um, uh, adequate pain relief. So orally we use a combination of uh, paracetamol and uh, ibuprofen. So one of the paracetamol ibuprofen combination is our starting point and we would usually give them three times a day, post breakfast, post lunch, post dinner. This is what we start with. If we need to go to injectables, I have found diclofenac to be extremely potent uh, uh, injectable analgesic. Surprisingly, I don't know why, I've not found oral diclofenac to be that effective, but I have found injectable. So all my uh, thoracoscopy patients actually in the post-op period get a mixture of injectable paracetamol because ibuprofen is not available in an injectable form. So in the immediate post-op period, they get a combination of injectable paracetamol and injectable diclofenac. And as soon as they are able to shift to orally, they go to paracetamol ibuprofen combination. But as I said, whether you use one agent or two agent or you supplement it with third agent depends on the pain threshold of the patient. Sometimes when giving a combination of paracetamol or ibuprofen does not help. We add a fentanyl patch to these patients. So about 12.5 milligram of fentanyl patch put uh, um, uh, on the skin uh, helps these patients. The only drawback of that that I see in many patients is that a lot of patients have vomiting with that. So these are the combination. You of course you have to be very careful with the. Uh, diabetic patients, kidney disease patients, hypertensive patients, elderly patients, their NSAIDs have to be used very carefully. So if we have anybody who's a long term, 20, more than 20 years diabetic, hypertensive, has any history of kidney disease, uh, we feel that kidneys could be, or has a borderline 1.72 kind of a creatinine, we avoid diclofenac as well as ibuprofen completely. We use crocin, uh, uh, we use uh, paracetamol, and then we uh, use fentanyl uh, in injectable or patch form in those patients. Usually, morphine, pethidine, I don't use. I have not used it for the last 10, 15 years. Great. Uh, regarding uh, <coughs> prophylactic chest... Uh, sorry, just one small point. We also use uh, uh, these uh, uh, gels, the local creams. Yeah. Yeah, so the site around the chest tube, you can have diclofenic creams are available, various uh, combinations are available. So we also use a lot of local cream application for additive. Gel, for additive. Any gel yes. yeah. 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 A prophylactic tube placement in a severe chest trauma where the patient doesn't actually have hemothorax or not a marked hemothorax. 
may be a candidate for uh, intermittent positive pressure respiration. So what is your take on that and uh, how, uh, is it any different from the way we, you have explained yeah. in your main presentation? Sure. sure. So uh, if there is no hemothorax, there is no pneumothorax and patient is just to be put on ventilator because of say head injury and patient has no problem at all. I, I don't put prophylactic chest tubes in that situation. However, there could be a situation where you have associated multiple rib fractures and maybe a minimal hemothorax. Exactly. That's a situation. Yeah. So that is a situation where if the patient is being put on positive pressure ventilation, it may be safer to put a chest tube on, 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 the, on the side of multiple rib fractures. More important is, and this is something we see more often because most of these patients will have some or the other reason obvious to put a chest tube, that once you have put a chest tube, you don't remove chest tube in a patient who is still on ventilator or has a possibility of going on ventilator. So a patient who is on ventilator or may go on ventilator, even if he's meeting all other criteria for removal of the chest tube, you will hold on till the patient comes on spontaneous breathing. Reason, if this patient who is on ventilator has any amount of pneumothorax, it will be few minutes in which it will convert into tension. Therefore, you don't. And that is the reason why if the patient has, is on ventilator and has a chest tube and has any air leak, there is, I mean, clamping the tube is a big no, no, no band because you will immediately precipitate tension. All right. Uh, this uh, related to use of antimicrobials. How do you look at uh, chest tube placement in terms of antimicrobial therapy? Do you look at it as something which is uh, to be used only as a prophylactic, or do you think it has to be continued as an empirical therapy so that the patient doesn't develop infective complications? Yes, yeah, so I want to tell that. Antimicrobials are not a replacement for asepsis. And this is a very strong message I want to give to my uh, resident colleagues because there is a tendency developing amongst a lot of us that we will substitute asepsis with antimicrobials. Antimicrobials are not a substitute for asepsis. Asepsis is paramount, of course. Even with asepsis, there will be situations where you would use antimicrobials. So those are to be used. Now, what combination to use? Definitely, uh, when you are putting a chest tube, you would like this patient to be on some antibiotics. If it's a community kind of a, a plural effusion, patient is otherwise okay, then maybe something like, uh, uh, you know, amoxicillin, clavulonic acid combination, some average level antibiotic would suffice. Of course, when you have ICU-like situations, patients are having multiple problems, patients are on ventilator, patients are having chest infection, then according to the flora of your hospital, according to the flora and culture sensitivity of your hospital, of your ICU, and any culture grown from any of the other places, you will need to up the antibiotic uh, based on those results. But more important message is asepsis is the most important. Uh, how long can we keep so that? Just, just one sure. So antibiotic is not for chest tube site infection. Antibiotics these people will be getting for concomitant associated other problems like chest infection, abdominal infection, bone injuries or other injuries. Those are more so I think it's very clear message that you have given that mere presence of chest tube is not an indication for antimicrobial therapy. No. There has to be some other, other condition reason. or other reason for it. Yeah. That's right. But having ensured that you've taken a septic Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> one more question. Yeah. That was related to open thoracostomy. And how long can you, sorry, first is how long can you keep the tube would there be a time when you think that this tube has been present for a long enough time and I must change it? And when would you take a call that, okay, this patient now needs to be converted to an open thoracostomy drain? See, there is no uh, upper limit for keeping the chest tube. It also depends on, on the reason why 
so if you are needing a chest tube to be kept beyond a few weeks there has to be a reason so what would be the reason you will you are probably having air leaking out if air is leaking out then it's an indication for intervention so let's come to a situation called primary spontaneous pneumothorax or secondary spontaneous pneumothorax now these cases will present to you with pneumothorax lung is collapsed you put a chest tube the lung expands now there are definite indications for intervention in these patients when you put chest tube in next 48 72 hours your lung should expand if the lung expands completely your air leak should stop in about 5 to 7 days time now various international thoracic societies say that if your lung refuses to expand per primum after putting a chest tube or it expands but your air leak continues beyond 7 to 10 days then that's an indication for exploration for ectoscopic or open because then they will have a blab or a bulla or something which is leaking out this is in a situation of pneumothorax now if you have say hemothorax and you have blood coming out for many 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 weeks that means there is a, some kind of a continuing bleeding there that needs to be explored more often what we see is that there is a big hematoma with uh, hemothorax which occurs you put a chest tube partly drainage occurs the clots remain inside and you have about 100 120 ml of dark brown fluid coming out you do a ct you will find that there is a big collection residual collection inside then that collection needs to be drained another situation is chylothorax you've got some chylous material it keeps coming out so if you are needing to keep the chest tube for beyond a few weeks please look for the cause and address the cause continuing to keep the chest tube is not going to give you cure of the primary problem the primary problem needs to be addressed great uh, when, when when do you think uh, is uh, thoracocentesis is enough and when does the thoracocentesis needs to be changed to an intercostal drainage why well, thoracocentesis I mean, as is simple as simple aspiration yeah well that depends on the again the pathology so when you have pneumothorax and it's less than one third of your total cavity patient is absolutely comfortable then there are two options one you can just observe the patient or some people will just do a one time needle aspiration but after that if your uh, your your air reaccumulates then you go in for a chest tube insertion but i would say that uh, instead of needle aspiration if you have a significant amount of pneumothorax i think putting a small size chest tube is a safer option because then after that you can sleep at peace if you just aspirate you would always have this possibility if the air reaccumulates i have to put a chest tube again uh, about uh, thoracos i mean the chest tube so another thing is if you have fluid now coming to fluid there is a small amount of fluid is there you do a diagnostic and therapeutic aspirate your fluid is completely drained you do an ultrasound you find there is no fluid you send it for analysis you start treatment accordingly few days later you repeat the patient is fine there is no need for chest for for a chest tube but this patient comes back at 48 hours the whole fluid has reaccumulated now at this stage i have seen people reaspirating 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 and we had patients having had 7 8 9 10 times aspiration remember every aspiration in radiology suite or wherever has a possibility of introducing infection the more the number of aspiration the more the chance of infection so therefore if any patient has been aspirated once and has reaccumulated and is again having fluid i would go for a chest tube insertion complete drainage and keep the tube there for few days one time single careful chest tube insertion is safer done properly is safer than the risks associated with multiple multiple aspiration being done i hope i answered uh, absolutely i think you have answered questions in great details with a lot of passion and really <clears throat> thank you very much for bringing in so much passion and energy into this have presentation reached, have reached five, yes yeah. so uh, <clears throat> i think uh, questions that we have received we have tried to moderate them uh so i've got the questions answered than 65 questions but sir has been kind to you know assimilate yeah, yeah. otherwise it's impossible yeah, that's that's his experience as a moderator uh <clears throat> still there may be a few questions you know which may not have been answered you are welcome to contact us on the number that we have given you and through uh, healthium channel you would receive the 
answers to these questions from Professor Arvind Kumar. I think it's been my singular pleasure to have moderated this session. And also I felt that probably if it had happened earlier in my career, I would have learned a few more things more exhaustively your, and would your, have been a better search. That's your modesty, sir. Th thank you, Professor Kumar, for a beautiful uh, presentation. And I would now give it over to Professor Kumar for the final conclusion to this very wonderful program. And the next program in the series would be uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, next ASI webinar on 18th September 2019. And the speaker is Dr. Sarfaraz Beg from Kolkata. And the topic is best groin hernia repair, avoiding complication traps. And the Health Hip Channel and ASI would be reaching you uh, with the link and the date and the time of the program. Thank you and over to Professor. So as uh, uh, we informed that every month, third Wednesday, 3.30 to 5 o'clock is the fixed uh, day and time for the monthly webinar, which will be a routine activity in ASI now. As Sir announced, next month will be by Dr. Sapraj Beg from Kolkata who will be addressing you on a very important topic of groin hernia. So please remember to join us next month, third Wednesday, 3.30 to 5, and be in touch with your LDM representatives. They are your friends, so be in touch with them, and they'll be sending you the links by which you can join. Once again, towards the end, on behalf of Association of Surgeons of India, it's my very pleasant duty to thank our colleagues across the country for having joined us in large numbers in this program. I hope the program was of some use to you and you've learned some new points which will help us in giving better care to our patients, something that we all exist for. I cannot close this program without once again thanking, thanking Healthium once again mentioning about Mr. Bafna's vision, but most important, I would like Mr. Srinivas to please come. He's flown down to Delhi from Bangalore. He's the one who's coordinating the Healthium's activity across the country. What I want to make a special mention of is his passion about quality. He called me a couple of days back and he said, sir, uh, although everything is fixed, but we need to check, 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 cross check and recheck. So he reached here yesterday morning. We had a dry run yesterday to see that everything is sorted. From where I will sit to where Professor Malik will sit to where the laptop will be kept. Everything he went into details of. Today also, we all assembled here at 2.30. One hour before we went live, he was checking everything. And there is one gentleman by name, Mr. Chandu in Bangalore with whom was, he was regularly in touch with. So very, very special thanks to Mrs. Srinivasan for being the anchor and the main force from LDM side and bringing this quality element. There is a message for each one of us. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. We have LDM. would like to just offer you a small... Well, okay. these flowers are okay. for all our friends from across the world. Have a wonderful evening, all of you friends. Thank you. And we are now signing off and we look forward to meet you again third Wednesday of next month, 3.30 p.m. Till then, good luck and goodbye. Thank you.